Hello. Are you under the blankets or in a good chair? Are your decorations up, even if it's just a tchotchke from the drugstore or snow globe you received from your first wife? Before I came downstairs to record, I gave my tree a drink. I got it last week. And I'm happy to tell you that it's holding its needles very well. After we finish, I'm going to go upstairs and sit next to it for a bit before I go to bed myself. Have a chocolate covered pretzel and try not to think about where my tax dollars are going. But I feel we'll both be pretty tired after this one because I have some Christmas tree literature to share with you. One piece by me, the other, a Christmas tree classic that I think will make for a potent combination to help you doze off. Not to mention this beautiful harp music by the wonderful Mary Lattimore. I was clearing some old hard drives to make space for new cookie photos and came across this poem in my notes for the holiday special I made in 2016 about how to pick out the perfect Christmas tree. It's not good, but that's exactly why amateur poetry is worth sharing. The most famous celebrity in Rockefeller Center, bigger than even Jim Fallon. A tradition, something new. Christmas trees are a lot of things. They are trees. They are symbols. The only time you get to have a tree in your home. A beacon for family, shaped like a missile. Something to compliment, sit under, nap next to. They are a symbol of immortality to both ancient Romans and Chinese. For sale in the Home Depot parking lot. I never claimed to be a poet, but maybe I should so I can get the record for using the words tree and symbol the most amount of times in one poem. Okay, continuing on. Evergreens have been on this planet for 300 million years. They can live for thousands of human years, but the ones in our home have been cut at eight years not as showy as the ginkgo, sweet gum, or sugar maple in fall. They are consistent, dependably green, the backdrop for a nativity scene. Something to pretend to look at when you're shy at a party. Top with angels, and top with stars, a reflection of the person who decorated it. Decorate it with your stepchildren and earn their respect. I know I'm not your dad, but let me show you an ornament trick. In front yards and backyards, malls and hotel lobbies, when covered in family ornaments, it's linked to all the trees you had before it and every one that comes after. The oldest woman in Michigan, Benita Gibson, 112, does she remember a favorite tree? Thank you, thank you. It was very embarrassing, but I just wrote it to help me brainstorm. A lot has changed since then, and I did update the last line for you, because sadly, there is a new oldest woman in Michigan. And it's not because Benita began to age faster. If time didn't pass, though, it wouldn't be the holidays again, and we'd always be waiting for Santa. It's not always easy to sleep this time of year, laying awake, deciding whether to serve wine-braised brisket or salmon with dill for your Hanukkah party, or just thinking about presents like my friend with. Hey, dude. Hey, how's it going, Whit? Really good. How you doing, pal? Pretty good. Yeah. Do you have any... Uh, really nice memories of Christmas morning in Alabama? I do. I My favorite memory of Christmas is uh, 
my big brother actually I, I always had a pretty chill Christmas because I was I liked all this it was pretty easy to get me a present as a kid it was like I was obsessed with Batman so they just would get me something Batman related yeah that, that was a blast or then I liked skating and so they'd get me a skateboard and, and that was that but there was when I was a little kid my brother really wanted a BB gun um, and we opened all our presents and hung out and you know my brother was clearly disappointed but he wasn't going to say anything about like where's my bb gun mm -hmm. and so he just lived you know like out the rest of christmas day kind of trying as hard as he could not to think about the bb gun and enjoy his other gifts and then my dad uh who's my brother's stepdad was was like you need to clean all of the christmas mess like all the paper all that stuff, wrapping paper and all that stuff uh -huh. my brother was sort of upset by that because my dad wasn't helping and i wasn't helping my mom wasn't helping and uh my dad hid the bb gun under all of the trash <laughs> and then my brother got to it and he flipped out it was the coolest thing and i always thought if i ever had a kid i would do that prank my child <laughs> Than to like a great kid. Yeah, that's really fun. just a good dig to the trash to find the gun, son. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he did. He dug through a bunch of trash, found the gun, and then we immediately went outside. He killed a squirrel. That's <laughs> <laughs> how. <laughs> how old were you? How old were you at that point? I must have been five, and so he was ten. <laughs> wow, that's a pretty distinct Christmas memory. And do you remember, how did you feel when the, you saw the squirrel get shot? I felt awful, and I immediately knew, like, oh, I don't ever want a gun of any kind. I think my brother probably felt the same way. I don't remember him playing with the gun a lot. <laughs> that's so funny. You've learned... <laughs> He was given the power of death and then learned the responsibility on the same exact morning. Well, yeah, all of in an hour. <laughs> uh, so, can I ask before we go, do you have a favorite comfort movie? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a hard question. I, I would say probably my number one is Hobbit Unexpected Journey. Great choice. It's really good. That was my friend Whitmer Thomas, who shares my passion for the holidays. I like this time of year, in real life, but also for inspiration. There's that theory that a writer or filmmaker has only a few melodies or themes they will revisit over and over their entire career. And if mine is Christmas trees, I'm okay with that. I know I can find peace next to a Christmas tree, lit up at night when everyone else is in bed. I know I can find peace taking an evening walk in the snow. If those are my things, along with fires and soft light, so be it. A little simple and boring, but sometimes I feel lucky to be boring, lucky to have some peace. And I wish it for you and everyone else. Well, almost. Anyone involved in the production or sales of armaments should get the Ebenezer Scrooge treatment this holiday. Three ghosts, no sleep. Sorry, I'll avoid the rant zone. Have you figured out what the themes of your life are? Hmm. I don't know if chewing tobacco is a theme. Hmm. Well, when you put it that way, you know, you should write a short story about it. I've been thinking that after my upcoming tour, perhaps the remainder of my career should just entail making a Christmas film every other year. I'm tinkering on one now called The Christmas Divorce. There's a scene in which the couple, together with their respective lawyers, goes through their ornament collection piece by piece to decide who gets to keep each one. 
There are big fights, but also wonderful memories that resurface as the ornament collection tells the story of their relationship. And through the process, they consider that maybe they shouldn't separate after all and confess to each other their big secret, that they are both Santa. I'll keep working on it. You notice me staring into space. That's where my head's at. If you're still awake, staring into space, try closing your eyes. And then imagine you are next to a well-lit tree or fire, laying in a combination of its warm yellow light and the blue light of the television, right on the living room rug because the couch and chairs are taken. Or perhaps you have back issues and the floor is just more comfortable. You've just made a mug of cocoa and have got a few pillows under your neck to angle yourself towards the movie. Something you've seen before. So many times that you can almost visualize what's going on by the voices. It's toasty and you wonder if you should take off your sweater, but you're tired and that require you to move. Sleep is so easy now, but one thought keeps you from it. What about the boy? But the boy is safe. He is clever and his homemade traps will do their job as they have since 1990. All right then. Dissolving into the fuzz of warmth and soft light, begin to dream what it'd be like to be a Christmas tree yourself. What kind would you be? A big one? A small one? On a family tree farm? Or in the woods? Let me help by sharing a fairy tale from 1845 by Hans Christian Andersen that does just that. It's not as sweet as the night before Christmas, and unlike the snowman, an old friend of a film that also deals with impermanence and mortality, this story handles the subject in a more peculiar, even harsh way, almost to the point where it feels unnecessary, but that's why I find it humorous and interesting, especially the last sentence. Hopefully it's not too bleak, but if all goes well, it won't matter because you'll be asleep before it finishes. The Fir Tree by Hans Christian Andersen, translated by Jean Herschel. Out in the woods stood such a pretty little fir tree. It grew in a good place, where it had plenty of sun and plenty of fresh air. Around it stood many tall comrades, both fir trees and pines. The little fir tree was in a headlong hurry to grow up didn't care a thing for the warm sunshine or the fresh air, and it took no interest in the peasant children who ran about chattering when they came to pick strawberries or raspberries. Often, when the children had picked their pails full or had gathered long strings of berries threaded on straws, they would sit down to rest near the little fir. Oh, isn't it a nice little tree, they would say, it's the baby of the woods. The little tree didn't like their remarks at all. Next year, it shot up a long joint of new growth, and the following year, another joint still longer. You can always tell how old the fir tree is by counting the number of joints it has. I wish I were a grown-up tree like my comrades, the little tree sighed. Then, I could stretch out my branches and see from my top what the world is like. The birds would make me their nesting place, and when the wind blew, I could bow back and forth with all the great trees. It took no pleasure in the sunshine, nor in the birds. The glowing clouds that sailed overhead at sunrise and sunset meant nothing to it. In winter, 
When the snow lay sparkling on the ground, the hare would often come hopping along and jump right over at the little tree. Oh, how irritating that was. It happened for two winters, but when the third winter came, the tree was so tall that the hare had to turn aside and hop around it. Oh, to grow, grow. To get older and taller, the little tree thought. That is the most wonderful thing in this world. In autumn, woodcutters came and cut down a few of the largest trees. This happened every year. The young fir was no longer a baby tree, and it trembled to see how those stately great trees crashed to the ground, how their limbs were lopped off, and how lean they looked as the naked trunks were loaded into carts. It could hardly recognize the trees it had known when the horses pulled them out of the woods. Where were they going? What would become of them? In the springtime, when swallows and storks came back, the tree asked them, do you know where the other trees went? Have you met them? The swallows knew nothing about it, but the stork looked thoughtful and nodded his head. Yes, I think I met them, he said. On my way from Egypt, I met many new ships, and some had tall, stately masts. They may well have been the trees you mean, for I remember the smell of fur. They wanted to be remembered to you. Oh, I wish I were old enough to travel on the sea. Please tell me what it really is and how it looks. That would take too long to tell, said the stork, and he strode off. Rejoice in your youth, said the sunbeams. Take pride in your growing strength and in the stir of life within you. And the wind kissed the tree, and the dew wept over it, for the tree was young and without understanding. When Christmas came near, many young trees were cut down. Some were not even as old or as tall as this fir tree of ours, who was in such a hurry and fret to go traveling. These young trees, which were always the handsomest ones, had their branches left on them when they were loaded on carts and the horses drew them out of the woods. Where can they be going? The young fir tree wondered. They are no taller than I am. One was really much smaller than I am. Why are they allowed to keep all their branches? Where can they be going? We know, we know, the sparrows chirp. We have been to town and have peeped in the windows. We know where they are going. The greatest splendor and glory you can imagine awaits them. We've peeped through windows. We've seen them planted right in the middle of a warm room and decked out with the most splendid things, gold apples, good gingerbread, gay toys, and many hundreds of candles. And then, asked the fir tree, trembling in every twig, and then, what happens then? We saw nothing more, and never have we seen anything that could match it. I wonder if I was created for such a glorious future, the fir tree rejoiced. Why, that is better than to cross the sea. I'm tormented with longing. Oh, if Christmas would only come. I'm just as tall and grown up as the trees they chose last year. How I wish I were already in the cart, on my way to the warm room where there's so much splendor and glory. Then, then something even better, something still more important is bound to happen. Why should they deck me so fine? Yes, there must be something still grander, but what? Oh, how I long. I don't know what's the matter with me. Enjoy us while you may, the air and sunlight told him. Rejoice in the days of your youth, out here in the open. But the tree did not rejoice at all. It just grew. It grew and was green both winter and summer, dark evergreen. People who passed it said, there's a beautiful tree. And when Christmas time came again, they cut it down first. The ax struck deep into its marrow. The tree sighed as it fell to the ground. It felt faint with pain. 
Instead of the happiness that it expected, the tree was sorry to leave the home where it had grown up. It knew that never again would it see its dear old comrades, the little bushes and the flowers about it, and perhaps not even the birds. The departure was anything but pleasant. The tree did not get over it until all the trees were unloaded in the yard, and it heard a man say, that's a splendid one, that's the tree for us. Then two servants came in in fine livery and carried the fir tree into a big splendid drawing room. Portraits were hung all around the walls. On either side of the white porcelain stove, great Chinese vases with lions on the lids of them. There were easy chairs, silk covered sofas, and long tables strewn with picture books and with toys that were worth a mint or money, or so the children said. The fir tree was planted in a large tub filled with sand, but no one could see that it was a tub because it was wrapped in a gay green cloth and set on a many colored carpet. How the tree quivered. What would come next? The servants and even young ladies helped it on with its fine decorations. From its branches, they hung little nets cut out of colored paper, and each net was filled with candles. Gilded apples and walnuts hung in clusters as if they grew there, and a hundred little white, blue, and even red candles were fastened to its twigs. Among its green branches swayed dolls that it took to be real living people, for the tree had never seen their like before. And up at its very top was set a large gold tinsel star. It was splendid, I tell you, splendid beyond all words. Tonight, they all said, ah, tonight how the tree will shine. Oh, thought the tree, if tonight would only come, if only the candles were lit, and after that, what happens then? Will the trees come trooping out of the woods to see me? Will the sparrows flock to the windows? Shall I take root here and stand in fine ornaments all winter and summer long? That was how much you knew about it. All its longing had gone to its bark and set it to arching, which is as bad for a tree as a headache is for us. Now the candles were lighted. What a dazzling splendor. What a blaze of light. The tree quivered so in every bough that a candle set one of its twigs ablaze. It hurt terribly. Mercy me, cried every young lady, and the fire was quickly put out. The tree no longer dared rustle a twig. It was awful. Wouldn't it be terrible if it were to drop one of its ornaments? Its own brilliance dazzled it. Suddenly, the folding doors were thrown back, and the whole flock of children burst in as if they would overturn the tree completely. Their elders marched in after them more sedately. For a moment, but only for a moment, the young ones were stricken speechless. Then they shouted till the rafters rang. They danced about the tree, plucked off one present after another. What are they up to? The tree wondered, what will happen next? As the candles burned down to the bark, they were snuffed out one by one, and the children had permission to plunder the tree. They went about it in such earnest that the branches crackled, and if the tree had not been tied to the ceiling by the gold star at the top, it would have tumbled headlong. The children danced about with their splendid playthings, no one looked at the tree now, except an old nurse who peered in among the branches, but this was only to make sure that not an apple or fig had been overlooked. Tell us a story, the children clamored as they towed the fat little man to the tree. He sat down beneath it and said, here we are in the woods and it will do the tree a lot of good to listen to our story. Mind you, I'll only tell one, which will you have? The story of Ivity Avity, or the one about Humpty Dumpty who tumbled downstairs 
he had ascended the throne and married the princess. Ivity avity, cried some. Humpty Dumpty, cried the others, and there was a great hullabaloo. Only the fir tree held its peace, though it thought to itself, am I to be left out of this? Isn't there anything I can do? For all of the fun of the evening had centered upon it, and it had played its part well. A fat little man told them all about Humpty Dumpty, who tumbled downstairs. He had ascended the throne and married the princess. And the children clapped and shouted, Tell us another one, tell us another one. For they wanted to hear about Ivity Avity too. But after Humpty Dumpty, the storytelling was stopped. The fir tree stood very still as it pondered how the birds in the woods had never told it a story equal to this. Humpty Dumpty tumbled downstairs, yet he married the princess. Imagine, that must be how things happen in the world. He can never tell. Maybe I'll tumble downstairs and marry a princess too, thought the fir tree, who believed every word of the story because such a nice man had told it. The tree looked forward to the following day when they would deck it again with fruit and toys, candles and gold. Tomorrow I shall not quiver, it decided. I'll enjoy my splendor to the full. Tomorrow I shall hear about Humpty Dumpty again and perhaps about Ividy Avidy too. All night long the tree stood silent as it dreamed its dreams and next morning butler and the maid came down with their dusters. Now my splendor will be renewed, the fir tree thought, but they dragged it upstairs to the garret, where they left it in the dark corner where no daylight ever came. What is the meaning of this? The tree wondered. What am I going to do here? What story shall I hear? I leaned against the wall, lost in dreams. It had plenty of time for dreaming, as the days and the nights went by. Nobody came to the garret, and when at last someone did come, it was only to put many big boxes away in the corner. The tree was quite hidden. One might think it had been entirely forgotten. It's still winter outside, the tree thought. The earth is too hard and covered with snow for them to plant me now. I must have been put here for shelter until springtime comes. How thoughtful of them. How good people are. Only, I wish it weren't so dark here and so very, very lonely. There's not even a little hair. It was so friendly out in the woods when the snow was on the ground and the hare came hopping along. Yes, he was friendly even when he jumped right over me, though I did not think so then. Here, it's all so terribly lonely. Squeak, squeak, said the little mouse just then. He crept across the floor, and another one followed him. They sniffed the fir tree and rustled in and out among its branches. It is fearfully cold, one of them said. Except for that, it would be very nice here, wouldn't it, the old fir tree? I'm not at all old said the fir tree. Many trees are much older than I am. Where did you come from? The mice asked them. And what do you know? They were the most inquisitive creatures. Tell us about the most beautiful place in the world. Have you been there? Were you ever in the larder where there are cheeses on shelves and hams that hang from the rafters? It's the place where you can dance upon tallow candles where you can dart in thin and squeeze out fat. I know nothing of the place, said the tree, but I know the woods where the sun shines and the little birds sing. Then it told them about its youth. The little mice had never heard the like of it. They listened very intently and said, my, how much you have seen and how happy it must have made you. I, the fir tree thought about it, Yes, those days were rather amusing. And he went on to tell them about Christmas Eve when it was decked out with candies and candles. Oh, said the little mice, 
How lucky you have been, you old fir tree. I'm not old at all, it insisted. I came out of the woods just this winter, and I'm really in the prime of life, but the moment my growth is suspended. How nicely you tell things, said the mice. The next night, they came with four other mice to hear what the tree had to say. The more it talked, the more clearly it recalled things, and it thought those were happy times, but they may still come back. They may come back again. Humpty Dumpty fell downstairs, and yet he married the princess. Maybe the same thing will happen to me. They thought about a charming little birch tree that grew out in the woods. To the fir tree, she was a real and lovely princess. Who is Humpty Dumpty? The mice asked it. So the fir tree told them the whole story, for it could remember it word by word. The little mice were ready to jump to the top of the tree for joy. The next night, many more mice came to see the fir tree, and on Sunday, two rats paid it a call, but they said that the story was not very amusing. This made the little mice sad that they began to find it not so very interesting either. Is that the only story you know? The rats asked. Only that one, the tree answered. I heard it on the happiest evening of my life, but I did not know then how happy I was. It's a very silly story. Don't you know one that tells about bacon and candles? Can't you tell us a good larger story? No, said the tree. Then goodbye, and we won't be back, the rat said, and went away. At last, the little mice took to staying away too. The tree sighed. Oh, wasn't it pleasant when those gay little mice sat around and listened to all that I had to say? Now that too is past and gone, but I will take good care to enjoy myself once they let me out of here. When would that be? Well, it came to pass on a morning when people came up to clean out the garret. The boxes were moved, the tree was pulled out and thrown hard on the floor. But a servant dragged it at once to the stairway where there was daylight again. Now my life will start all over, the tree thought. It felt the fresh air and the first sunbeam strike as if it came out into the courtyard. This all happened so quickly, and there was so much going on around it, that the tree forgot to give even a glance at itself. The courtyard adjoined the garden, and flowers were blooming. Great masses of fragrant roses hung over the picket fence. The linden trees were in blossom, and between them, the swallows skimmed past calling, to Lyra, Lyra Lee, my love's come back to me but it was not the fir tree of whom they spoke. Now I shall live again, it rejoiced, and tried to stretch out its branches. Alas, they were withered, brown and brittle. It was tossed into a corner among weeds and nettles, but the gold star that was still tied to its top sparkled bravely in the sunlight. Several of the merry children who had danced around the tree and had taken such pleasure in it at Christmas were playing in the courtyard. One of the youngest seized upon it and tore off the tinsel star. Look what is still hanging on that ugly old Christmas tree, the child said, and stamped upon the branches until they cracked beneath his shoes. The tree saw the beautiful flowers blooming freshly in the garden. It saw itself wished that they had left it in the darkest corner of the garret. I thought of its own young days in the deep woods and of the merry Christmas Eve and of the little mice who had been so pleased when it told them the story of Humpty Dumpty. My days are over and past, said the poor tree. Why didn't I enjoy them while I could? Now they are gone, all gone. A servant came in and chopped the tree into little pieces. These heaped together quite high. The wood blazed beautifully under the big copper kettle, and the fir tree moaned so deeply that each groan sounded like a muffled shot. 
That's why the children who were playing nearby ran to make a circle around the flames, staring into the fire and crying, Piff Paff. But as each groan burst from it, the tree thought of a bright summer day in the woods, or a starlight winter night, the thought of Christmas Eve, the thought of Humpty Dumpty, which was the only story it ever heard and knew how to tell. And so the tree was burned completely away. The children played on in the courtyard. The youngest child wore on his breast the gold star that had topped the tree on its happiest night of all. But that was no more, and the tree was no more. There's no more to my story. No more, nothing more. All stories come to an end. There you have it. The Fir Tree by Hans Christian Andersen. Quite an interesting ending. Sorry if I interpreted it that way, but it felt like he was writing with a shrug. It's just, yeah, it's, it's a little rough. Chop it into firewood, but did he have to have it bullied by rats and have a kid step on it? If you're feeling bad for the tree or our tree and feeling upset, here's this. Hans Christian Andersen apparently stayed as a guest with Charles Dickens' family for five weeks, and everyone, including Dickens, was annoyed as hell at him. So, there. I hope that if you have guests this holiday, no one annoys you, and if you are a guest, you don't annoy anyone. Everyone gets along. Music by Mary Lattimore. Sound design by Ryan Dan. Guest appearance by Whitmer Thomas. Produced by Grant Farsi for Chestnut Walnut. Thanks to our patrons for making this episode possible, but especially to Jake B, Jake W, Jonathan P, Beanie, Angst for the Memories, Jamie D, Mega Man Football, Madison H, Corey S, Anthony W. Happy holidays and good night. And best of luck to Benita Gibson. I hope she makes it to 113. <laughs>